Hello and a very warm welcome to this time of worship together as we join online to bring our lives before God and to receive again of his grace and his love. The Apostle Paul so often begins his letters to the early church with a reference to grace and peace. Here is an example from his second letter to the church in Corinth. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we come together in worship now, let us treasure those gifts of God and may we discover them afresh here and now. His grace, his peace. Let us adore the living God. This, this is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power, and neither knows measure nor end. Tis Jesus, the first and the last, whose spirit shall guide us safe home. We'll praise him for God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power, and neither knows measure nor end. Tis Jesus, the first and the last, whose spirit shall guide us safe home. We'll praise him for all that is past. Let us pray. Jesus, we know you as human, living like us with a family and friends, teaching and healing, bringing comfort and reassurance to those who followed you. But we also know you as God, a divine presence, the Messiah, the Saviour, the one for whom many were waiting, are waiting. This is a mystery, and yet, as a result, we can begin to understand the nature of the divine, the wonder and the joy. You show us God. You teach us of God. And so we come to worship you. Jesus, your life here on earth, living like us, was one of love. So we respond in love. Love for you, love for our neighbours, love for ourselves. Your death here among people like us, demanded by people like us, reminds us how much you were prepared to suffer to bridge the gap between us and God. This gracious gift is almost unbelievable, given by God, undeserved, even unasked for, a true gift of love. How can we not love in return? How can we not praise you? How can we not try to live in your way? And yet we so often take this gift for granted. It is not our first thought in the morning. It is not our last memory as we wrap ourselves with sleep. We are not thankful. We do not allow it to change our lives. We remain selfish and impatient, reluctant to share, happy to build barriers, judging those who are different. Jesus, we need to be forgiven.
Jesus, here on your earth you showed us the depth of forgiving love, and on that we rely. As we come to know that we are forgiven, may our lives also be renewed in gratitude for all that we have received. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 33, the first nine verses. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp, make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Thanks be to God.
The New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, beginning at the first verse. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was one of the most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowds. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree beside the road so that he could watch from there. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down, for I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the crowds were displeased. He's gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have overcharged people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a son of Abraham. And I, the son of man, have come to seek and save those like him who are lost. Thanks be to God for his word. Christian author Philip Yancey tells of an encounter between C.S. Lewis and other scholars at a religious conference. There was a debate about what, if any, belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation? Well, other religions have different versions of God appearing in human form. Resurrection? Again, other religions have accounts of return from death. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about? he asked. Ah, they're discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. Lewis responded, oh that's easy, it's grace. Well, C.S. Lewis wasn't a Methodist, but I think he certainly revealed here that he'd have made a good one. Grace. Yes, at the heart of Christianity, but one of the distinctives of the people called Methodists is to emphasise the wonder of God's grace and its potential to help us fulfil our divinely appointed mission to spread scriptural holiness through the land. Grace, as someone put it, is the love of God shown to the unlovely, the peace of God given to the restless the unmerited favour of God. John Wesley's preaching was full of the gospel of grace. His journal is full of entries that say things like, I offered the grace of God. I offered the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I proclaimed free salvation. I declared the free grace of God. John Wesley defined grace as God's bounty or favour his free, undeserved favour, having no claim to the least of his mercies. It was free grace that formed us of the dust of the ground and breathed into us a living soul, he said, and stamped on that soul the image of God and put all things under our feet. For there is nothing we have or are or do which can deserve the least thing at God's hand. I love the way American Methodist Michael Beck summarises the huge significance of grace. He says, Methodists continue to emphasise a personal experience of a seeking and sending Trinitarian God whose primary characteristic is relentless love. We experience the missional love of God through waves of grace 
and means of grace. Means of grace, prayer, searching, scripture, communion, fasting, holy conversation. And it's really important to emphasize the distinction, I think, between grace and karma. Because karma is such a popular thought in society these days that you get what you deserve. No, grace is the opposite of karma. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, the bounty, the favour of God. The encounter of Jesus with Zacchaeus gives us such a great insight into the reach and the potential of God's grace. The tale is one of the earliest Bible stories that I remember learning. Of course, as many of you will recognise, it was all about that song. Now, Zacchaeus was a very little man. Mrs. Morn, my Sunday school superintendent, Miss Kemp, my first Sunday school teacher, they taught it well. And it logged in here along with, here the pennies dropping and only a boy called David. Um, feel free to press pause and have a sing. If you wish at this point, I'll spare you from my rendition. But let's recognise the extraordinary, wondrous thing that God's grace is for us and for the world today as we see it in this account. Here's Zacchaeus, wealthy but deeply unpopular and presumably shunned. Short, it seems, not just in stature but in standing within his community. And he wants to see Jesus, perhaps he's simply curious or hoping for some hope in his life. It's unclear. But presumably he knew that he'd never make it to the front of the crowd. And so he climbs a sycamore fig tree. And along comes Jesus, full of grace and truth. With urgency, Jesus speaks, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And with great brevity, it seems that the conversation does immediately shift to Zacchaeus's home. Grace has come into that home. And Zacchaeus, as Jesus observes, is transformed by that grace. Here and now, he says, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, anybody out of anything, and he will have done, I will pay back four times the amount, four times. What do we see about grace here then? Firstly, yes, grace reaches out recklessly, unconditionally. Jesus' ministry is full of of those waves of grace that Michael Beck refers to. There's no assessment process. There's no entry requirements. There's no bar to achieve. In fact, Jesus demonstrates here and elsewhere that God has a preference for pouring grace into the lives of those who everyone else has decided are beyond the unpopular, the outcasts, those stuck up a tree. That this is the nature of grace is at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Good news for everyone. And as the people called Methodists, we recognise that this going out there type of grace is prevenient grace, part of our uh, lexicon, our heritage. It was an awareness of that grace that made John Wesley submit to be more vile and preach outdoors in the fields near Bristol and then around the country. Grace to be shared with those who need it most. Too good to be kept quiet, too good to be kept in the church. See how this is so important. Many in our world have swallowed the idea of karma. And of course it's been there in some of our uh, past too. You get what you deserve. But we gather around a gospel of reckless, extravagant grace. But there's more about grace here in this story of Zacchaeus and Jesus. The wonderful thing about God's grace is that, yes, 
it freely pours love and acceptance into our lives but then god's grace seeks to shape our lives for the better that the life of heaven might become more fully the life we know and lead and that needs our response so zacchaeus his now his house now filled with the grace of jesus he responds with a statement and a commitment to generosity and a new way of living and jesus affirms that zacchaeus life has been saved he's found new life but it took a response from Zacchaeus, didn't it? Just as C.S. Lewis showed that he'd make a good Methodist, so I think Zacchaeus showed he'd make a good Methodist. For a key part of our DNA is that we will not only pour grace into the world, but that we will together work responsibly at responding to that grace. The field preaching, the serving the poor, the drawing together in worship, they were the key Wesley ways of helping people discover and receive grace. Just as Zacchaeus received grace halfway up a tree. But then the classes and the bands and the places of mutual accountability and love, those were the places where people respond to that grace. Responding responsibly justifying grace we call it putting ourselves right with god and sanctifying grace we call it getting our lives on the right track we receive waves of grace and then we respond responsibly through the means of grace through our life together through our praying through our conferring through our gathering at the sacraments we receive the reckless grace of God, and then we're called to respond responsibly to that grace through the renewing and the accountability of our lives. But receiving and responding responsibly are key for us to really know the full power and the full intention of God's grace. That's when salvation really came to Zacchaeus, not just when he received, but when he responded to the fullness of God's grace. So do you now need today to receive God's grace afresh? Do you now need to take responsibility afresh for working out God's grace in your life more fully? What does salvation coming to your home your life really look like the gospel is all about grace undeserved and unexpected as rachel held evans put it grace has been out of hand for more than two thousand years we had better get used to it yes it's out of hand we can receive it you can receive it now and we can respond to it responsibly now too. Receive, respond. God's grace poured out for Zacchaeus, for us. What a gift. What good news at the heart of the gospel. So let's respond. Let's receive and as our next song says, through grace, may my life, your life, be changed, our hand in yours. Amen. Falling down And life lacks clarity I will look to you, my friend And hold your hand When the road 
Loggerheads unclear And chaos seems to swirl I will run the race, my friend My hand in yours I'll follow justice alone Seeking your holiness Through grace my life's been changed My hand in yours I'll follow justice alone Seeking your holiness Through grace my life's been changed My hand in yours My hand in yours When one neighbor has no food Another fills his place I will look to you, my friend What would you do? When so many have so much and others struggle by I will give myself to you my hands are yours I'll follow justice alone see Seeking your holiness Through grace my life's been changed My hand in yours I'll follow justice alone My life's been changed My hand in yours My hand in yours Let us pray. Spirit of God, inspire us to find ways of living out our faith in this world. We all have routines, our established ways, the things that we expect to do, our comfortable doing. But in the face of this world's suffering, do you call us to do more? with our experience of divine grace, a gift that has no limits. Do you ask us to move from what is familiar, to explore new areas of activity, to take on uncomfortable roles and different priorities? As we pray for our families and for those closest to us, do you call us to repair old wounds, to find ways of forgiving where hurts are deep, 
to restore relationships that have been broken for years. As we pray for our neighbours and for those with whom we work, do you call us to be aware of their fears and anxieties? To find ways of strengthening friendships and offering support? As we pray for the work of our churches, do you call us to abandon the securities of past activities that no longer meet the needs of our communities and risk exploring new ways of work, new ways of worship? As we pray for all in need across the globe, do you call us to examine our own society, the economics of our shopping, and accept that we may need to change our priorities so that others may have better lives? Spirit of God, inspire us to find ways of living out our faith in this world. Amen. And now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen.
What an amazing vision Charles Wesley sets before us there of the uh, fullness of grace in our lives, achieving that new creation for which we long. I wonder if I might suggest that uh, you take some time in, either immediately now or sometime soon uh, to sit quietly with God and to invite him to pour fresh grace into your life today, to receive afresh his love, his power, his peace, his grace that brings new life. And then also, as you sit with God, to ask how you can respond responsibly more fully. That would be a great theme to share with others in, in great Methodist tradition, perhaps in a house group or someone who you feel comfortable with as a Christian brother or sister, uh, to seek a, a mutual accountability about how life is and how, uh, like that conversation of Zacchaeus and Jesus, how you can respond responsibly to God's grace in your life. See what God would do as his free grace is made available to you and to me again today. My thanks to all those who've contributed to this time of worship together. I pray that it will have been a blessing and that God's Spirit will continue to bless you richly. We close with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.